Look at something a little bit different. We're going to spend uh, most of our uh, page turning this morning in, in the Old Testament. But what we want to talk about, but I want to preface it a little bit up front about what and, and why we're doing this. If you don't get anything else out of this morning other than this slide right here, you can go ahead and thank me for this at least, because apologetics uh, comes from the root of to speak in defense, right? So the next time your spouse looks at you and says, well, that apology was awfully defensive, you can say, well, yes, it was. Yes, it was. It's biblical to be defensive in your apology, unless you're me, and it doesn't work. All right, so but what we're going to do is we want to look at, this is the idea of kind of how we got here. And this is what we stress all through, especially in, in youth group in those early years, uh, is that I don't want anyone at any point in their life, when someone says, why are you a Christian for anyone's response to ever be because mom told me to, or grandpa told me to, or my youth minister told me to, or a pastor told me to, right? Like, we want you to know on your own. And so, some of that uh, we'll get into. I'm not, I'm not actually going to get into this head heart thing much, other than just to say that uh, there's not really a, a competition in this, in this head heart debate. Uh, just in that they're, they're both true and they both mean kind of the same thing and they both get us to where we want to go. Uh, this, you know, we, we all understand inside the, inside the church family, we understand the concept of, you know, Jesus in my heart and what that means. But we also understand that that's nowhere in biblical text anywhere, this idea of asking Jesus in my heart. Uh, the other thing I want to say is some of the reason that we're looking at this is, you know, First Peter, it says that, you know, everyone should be prepared to give an account, like give some reasons why you have hope, why you have joy, why you believe what you believe. And we see Paul doing this. Paul, it says uh, that, you know, in, in, first, in, in Acts, it says, you know, he went to uh, the temple every Sabbath, spent this time there for a year, uh, going every Sabbath, reasoning and persuading. So I want to start with this. So for, for what we talk about today, the, the boxes over here on your left are, we're going to call it, these are evidence boxes, okay? So boxes that evidence is either piled into or not. So if we have something now, whether it's children or adults, where we have an evidence box that's got nothing in it, there's nothing in the evidence box, but we have a firm belief in it, what is this called? What's this arrow in between the two? Okay. If we've got a box that's got tons and tons of evidence in it, and we have a firm belief in it, What's this arrow called? So universally, this gets the same response. I watched a guy use this example, and I sat there in silence, and he said, I've been doing this forever, and it always works. It works every time. Here's the thing. This is what I'm going to challenge. Um, hold on. Let me get to the next one, then we'll go there. This line is called crazy pants. It's not called faith, Right? Like, if we, if we believe this is, this is unicorns in a box and a firm belief, okay, we, we often do, we describe this as faith. But what I will say is the actual definition of faith and the biblical definition of faith, and where you can get this is from the Greek definition of faith, is that it's more like the atom. And this works really well, especially here in Oak Ridge, right? Because we understand uh, that while no one has actually ever physically, you know, visually seen an atom, the evidence box is overflowing. And again, living here in Oak Ridge, we all know very well that there's no doubt in the existence of the atom, right? Now, now the model of like how we think the atom does look has changed. Central Baptist has the, you know, the traditional hoops that were the Adam figure forever, and now it's more like a cloud. Um, but we understand that 
we have firm belief in Adam because the evidence box is full. The Greek definition of faith is that. It's where you don't believe in something just because, just because somebody said so. You have faith based on logic and sound reasoning. You can have faith in something because there is stuff in the evidence box. We're going to do a very broad overview today. Like, like you know, we're at 10,000 feet looking down. My hope is not that everyone walks out with, you know, a big overflowing giant evidence box, but that we can walk out and decide kind of where to look and be interested in where to look and what to look for and in, in what we're going to talk about this morning. Uh, what I will say is that this, this right here, this is why I think, this is why a lot of, um, look at my audience. this is why a lot of parents get really, really worried about when, they're, when their kid believes in a fairy tale or a mythical creature, mermaids, unicorns, whatever, right? Because their fear is, is that, okay, well, when they find out that unicorns aren't real, well, then that's going to mess them up with everything. Because they think that there's the same amount in the evidence box for unicorns as there is for God. And there's that fear. But what I want to look at today is what is actually in this box. All right, we're going to start in, we're going to start in the Old Testament. Um, So we know that predominantly through history, uh, there was the theory that the earth was flat. Now, a lot of people say that, you know, Columbus and Magellan fixed this, but it was, it was largely long before either one of them uh, that that notion went away for, for a lot of people. But we know kind of the very first mention of this uh, Pythagoras in the 6th century B.C., but it didn't catch on. It didn't go anywhere. Aristotle kind of demonstrated that the earth was round or spherical in about 330 B.C., and over the next 100 years, it was adopted even back then. You know, we're talking 200 B.C., this was, this was getting traction that the earth was not flat. But, uh, you know, up until even the 17th century, most of China still, you know, believed in flat earth. You would be shocked to know that there are still people um, who, who believe in flat earth, but that's for a whole other sermon. Uh, the creation stories from lots of different cultures uh, even have a flat earth in their creation stories, you know, their, their genesis in their mytho- mythology books. Uh, usually about you know a body of land and it's surrounded by a giant ocean sitting on this flat uh, flat surface. Okay, go to go to Isaiah. All right, so if you go to Isaiah and we're going to look at chapter forty. And we're going to look at just uh, verse 22. Isaiah 40, 22 says, It is he who sits above the... What word do you have in your translation? Circle. Some will say spherical uh, or sphere. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, who sits above the circle of the earth. Now, what's interesting here is that in Isaiah, uh, this is, Isaiah was written 400 years before Aristotle. It was written 2,000 years before um, what you have the, uh, before flat earth was kind of largely debunked in Isaiah, this was, okay? Look at um, the earth was largely believed for, in a lot of cultures, even here in North America, that the earth, flat again, sat on something. Uh, Some people it was a pillar, almost like a lamp stand. Uh, Some who believed it was a square, a perfect square, that it was 
you know, the square was like the top of the box, and the box extended down infinity, indefinitely, underneath, that it sat on that. Lots of cultures from all around the world, in Europe, in China, uh, Native Americans here in North America all had beliefs that it was sitting on the back of some kind of animal, a serpent or an elephant. Mostly, it uh, seems, even from all around the world, there was the belief that it was sitting on the back of a turtle for a lot of it. Greeks, of course, believed that it was sitting on top of a shield, a warrior's shield, or on the back of a Greek god. Now go to Job. Job... 26, we're going to come back to Job 26 here in a little bit, but right now let's look at Job uh, 26 verse 7. It says, he stretches out the north over the void and he hangs the earth on nothing. Hangs the earth on nothing. This written... 3,300 years before that famous picture that we have of Earth from space, right? They call it the blue marble photo that you see that it is a ball. It is a circle that sits on nothing. 3,300 years before that, we have this, this text where it says he sits it on nothing over the void. Counting the stars, uh, this we have originally around the time that uh, you know, we have any, any kind of recorded documents from scholars looking at this. There were debates about, you know, the range of stars going from 900 to 1,000. Uh, one of the most famous accounts, scholarly accounts, they finally landed on it was exactly 965 stars. When we got really super advanced, we got to, okay, there's actually 3,000. And then we got, you know, kind of modern advanced and we really knew it, we got to that there are 6,000 stars. All right, look at, go to Genesis 15.5 or Jeremiah, uh, either one. You can go to Genesis 15.5. God, of course, is giving the, the promise to Abraham. And he says, hey, he's talking about the number of his descendants. And how everyone is going to come from Abraham, the, the children of Abraham. And God says, hey, look up at the stars. Do me a favor. Try to count them if you can. And that's, that's going to be the number of your infinite uh, children on this. In Jeremiah 33, uh, 22, you have again where it says, you look up and it says, the stars are innumerable. It says, the heavenly host, the stars in the sky are innumerable. 3,000 years before the first telescope. Long before we even got to the 3,000 mark or the 6,000 belief. And of course, we now know the stars are in fact innumerable. I mean, we can't even get, can't even get anywhere close, even just looking at our own galaxy in the stars. But in biblical text, 3,000 years ago, you have the stars are innumerable. And, and, and understand that for every one verse I'm pulling out today, it's, it's for time's sake. And there's multiple and multiple on every one of these. And dozens and dozens of other topics that we won't even get to touch today. But in 2 Samuel, in 2 Samuel 22... He says the earth was laid bare and you could look out and you could see the valleys and the trenches under the ocean, on the floor of the ocean. That the ocean isn't a flat swimming pool that was believed. Uh, in Genesis 7, you know, the flood starts and it doesn't talk about rain, just rain, the clouds opening and rain flooding. It says the fountains under the ocean begin spraying water and filling up, and that's what also contributed to the flood. And in Genesis 8-2, it says the fountains under the deep were turned off. In Job 38, actually, go, go to that one. Go to Job 38. Job 38 is, is a really good one, that whole chapter, because that's the terrifying one where Job has you know, been making his account, his his fantastic friends have finally got the best of him, and he starts laying out, and he's, you know, you know, you're right. 
I didn't do anything wrong. This is ridiculous. It's not fair. And in Job 38, the heading of that says, God answers. And Job thoroughly regrets all of his conversations up to that point. Well, in this answer, uh, in Job 38, verse 16... Again, Job 38 starts with God looking at Job and going, remind me where you were standing exactly when I... And he goes through. And in verse 16, talking to Job, he says, Have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? We have over and over again in biblical texts showing that the bottom of the ocean floor completely impossible for anyone to know anything about the bottom of the ocean floor being filled with trenches uh, and valleys and mountains. And to me, the craziest part was this idea that we see that it is filled with fountains and springs coming up out of the deep, which, of course, we now know is scientifically accurate about how that works and the existence of them. Uh, Going through Job, several times in Job, and in Ecclesiastes as well, you have kind of these talks about the scientific, about the water cycle, about where the water comes from, and that the water comes from it is built up within the clouds, but the cloud doesn't break. Uh, It talks about how it evaporates and comes back in, and how it cycles and then turns back to rain, and how it all works going through explaining the water cycle through here. I once heard uh, Patrick Mead in in all of his talks. There's all kinds of things that stand out and things that we talk about. And we love when when Patrick comes and and hangs out with us and talks with us. But one time Patrick said, the reason why I first became a, a Christian, why I came back to the Bible and back to Jesus and back to Christianity was Leviticus. And everyone stops. Uh, mostly because you know, Leviticus is, uh, you know, the book that when you're reading your Bible through in a year that you get three or four verses in and then skip and, you know, get your little checkbox and move on to something else to read. But all through Leviticus and all through a lot of the Torah was this dealing with health, uh, sanitation, sickness, communal diseases, how to wash your hands, dealing with cleanliness, handling of food, all of these things to keep those people safe and keep that bloodline intact. And then you realize that they're learning about how to stay safe in bacteria and germs uh, three millennia before we ever first studied anything to do with germs at all. Last one I'm going to give you on the Old Testament. I want you to turn to this one. Turn to Psalm 102, and then you can, you can stay there uh, after that. Psalm 102, 25 through 27 says this. <clears throat> it says, Of old you laid the foundations of the earth, The heavens are a work of your hands. Starts out with, look, you made all this. And then 26 is what it says. It says, they will perish. Okay. But keep going. But you will remain. They will wear out like a garment. Everything you made, the foundations of the earth and the heavens, will perish as they wear out like a garment. It's crazy to hear... uh, Scientists give lectures on how, you know, in the book of Psalms, this concept of entropy was introduced. And that, you know, we're talking about theories developed in laws of thermodynamics and that the universe is spinning down, Earth is spinning down, energy is spinning down. Now, all I'm showing today are these little snippets about why we can say the Old Testament has something. There's something there. Why this isn't a a, a book of fairy tales, why there's ideas that are there that we can point to, we can hold on to, that have been scientifically validated. 
Let's look at the New Testament. <coughs> the New Testament was written over a span. Some people will go a little bit longer, but conservatively speaking, in best estimates, we can look at that uh, the, I said New Testament, the, the Bible itself was written over a span of 1,600 years. From the first writing to the last writing is a span of about 1,600 years. In that, in, in what we currently have and what you're holding in your lap or in front of you or on your phone or whatever, we have split out into 66 books. Now, some of those books were actually combined, and we split them for things and scroll length and whatever, but around 66 books is what you're, what you're holding in your hand, written over 1,600 years by about 40 different authors. And in those 40 different authors, you had people living on three different continents, and they wrote it in three different languages. Genesis to Revelation, how we have it set. Written over a span of 1,600 years, 66 books, 40 different authors, three different continents, three different languages. Four hundred thousand errors. This is really hard when someone tells you this. Until you look at it. 400,000 errors, okay? This is well documented. And, and, and largely studied, there is a professor at Chapel Hill who studies this, loves statistics, hates the Bible and Christianity, but he loves statistics. He's really good at it. And a lot of this comes from him. Nearly 300,000 of the 400,000 errors, they're spelling errors written by people like me who can't spell and ask their nine-year-old to spell for you, okay? They're spelling errors. I'm not kidding. I'm not making this up. This is not validated by Christian people, okay? But there's more, right? That, that still leaves 100,000. Okay, almost all of the rest 100,000 are where two words, have, where a word has been repeated twice. Jesus said, said, or where two words were swapped, they were transposed. Where again, you're writing the sentence and you accidentally flip two words. Which leaves about... Best estimates between 1 and 2%. So of the 400,000 errors, what I just told you makes up 98% of it. But here's the thing about the 1 or 2% that's left. Everyone, uh, including people who have tried to use these statistics to see what they could take away from biblical text all unanimously agree of the 1% to 2% that is left over, it has zero bearing on the theology or the teaching or the doctrine of the Father and Jesus Christ. None whatsoever. It's things like the, the end of Mark where something, you know, we're not sure when it was added. It was the adulterous woman that is in John, but it wasn't in a couple of the manuscripts. Things like that that are great and they're great stories, but they don't change anything about the story. They don't change anything whether you put them in or leave them out about who Jesus was or what Jesus taught. Which leaves us with what they call 98% literary, 98% pure. Pure. For a work that was written over a 1600 year span on three different continents and three different languages and 40 different people. So, in literary criticism, they'll take works <clears throat> and you try to figure out okay, how many manuscripts do we have of this work that we can compare? So, we can put them side by side and be like, these stories don't even look alike or they sound similar, or they're dead on, you know, whatever. How many different things do you have to look at, all right? They'll also look at things like, okay, how long after the original was the first copy made that we can find? So was someone, you know, was this like someone's great-great-grandchild copied this, or how far out are we? They'll look at things like that to figure it out. By far, the largest documented literary work uh, in, in literary history is the Iliad. The Iliad has 1,800 manuscripts. It, it's gone up. It used to be even less. They found more. 1,800 manuscripts, and the first copy was made 400 years after the original, which at this point in time, that is really fast. 400 years after the original. Everything we've got from, from Plato, you have 210 manuscripts 
The first copy of the, any of the originals was 1,300 years after. Gaelic Wars, which is you know, the big one from Caesar, you've got 251 manuscripts, and the first copy came 1,000 years after the original. Okay? Here's what we've got, literary criticism for the New Testament. Remember, the Iliad is the most well-documented. There's 1,800 manuscripts of the Iliad. It's nearly 6,000 manuscripts of the New Testament just in the Greek alone. There's another 20,000 manuscripts if you count all of the other languages that it was translated in along the way by the scribes. If you take the Old Testament in with it, we've got 42,000 plus manuscripts, historically speaking. Um, and, and, and a lot of people will say, well, there'd be even more, but you know, they, they came in and they burned a lot of the Jewish papers. Yeah, and we burned a lot of theirs when we came through too, so it, you know, we, we traded out on that. Here's the, here's the thing, though. On the New Testament, most all manuscripts, most all copies are within 100 years of the original. Uh, and most manuscripts, all, all manuscripts came, all writings came within 100 years of the event. As a matter of fact, all the New Testament, all the books of the New Testament were written within 60 years of Jesus' death. That you've got an original. 60 years of Jesus' death is where they date most of those. There's a fragment of John that comes 29 years after that they found. They actually just this past summer, it may have been in the spring, they found a new fragment from Mark dated to 85 AD. Uh, people will say, you know, who study these things, they say it's, there's, it's just not even fair. The evidence and the manuscripts and the documentation for the New Testament is unfathomable in comparing to what else you're studying in classical work. Some of them use this thing called stack height, where they look at, you know, if you take all of the fragments and all the manuscripts that you found and you stacked them, the pages, uh, papyri, on top of each other, how high would that go to show, you know, how much, how much evidence you have to, to work with, to look through. And for most classical writings, uh, you get four feet is on average. For most of the classical writings that you would study in college and things. The New Testament, if you stack the manuscripts and the fragments that you have, it'd be about a mile high. If you added the Old Testament fragments and that from the Torah, you'd get about two and a half miles, 13,200 feet that you've got stacked on here. None of this compares to Jesus. I'll say this. Having a debate with someone about if Jesus actually historically existed is ludicrous. It is the most, is the most well-documented historical event in the history of mankind. Uh, and anyone, non-Christian, atheist, science, will, will, will agree to this, who are, who are learned in this aspect. Most people will conservatively agree that Jesus fulfilled 48 prophecies while he was here on earth from the Old Testament, Old Testament prophecies, 48. One of them was uh, the Psalms reading uh, that we had this morning about, you know, on the ship. 48 prophecies. So they crunched this out and they said the odds of somebody doing that, the odds of someone fulfilling 48 prophecies is 10 to the 157. I am all English history. I hate math. This means nothing to me, okay? Reference sake... Electrons, you know, so small in the atom, so small we can't actually physically see them no matter what we use. Number of electrons estimated in the known universe is 10 to the 79th power. So half, less than half. The apostles died. And the apostles didn't just die, like they didn't just die in the New Testament books, right? Like we have historical writings non-biblical historical writings, lots of them from, from the Jewish writings, that document the, the apostles, the disciples dying. And people will say, people die for cults all the time. And people died for David Koresh. Yeah, but they believed it. They died for what they thought they believed in. People's argument is that the disciples planned all this, faked all this, wrote all this out. So you're telling me that they died for what they knew was a lie and they made up? Where's the payoff? 
when we talk about Roman executioners, won't go into this much, but understand that historically speaking, the, the crucifixion uh, was mastered. They were really, really good at it. And the people who, they didn't go randomly find someone and say, hey, go do this, you know, execute this person through crucifixion, right? Like these were, these were trained professional killers. This is what they did. Uh, the American Medical Journal uh, has run numerous articles that say historical documentation proves Jesus Christ did in fact die on the cross. They will say that. Accounts of how it happened, water coming out of the side that we now know is, a, is part of it. Like they, they, Everyone, again, it is one of the most well-documented accounts in history. Jesus did die on that cross by professional executioners. Soldiers guarding the tomb. They're like, well, you know, they, they fell asleep or they were in on it or they, they walked away because they got tired or whatever. Again, these are professionals. And Rome was convinced, like, if this dude's body disappears because his disciples come and drag him off, we have a coup. Like, it's going to be nasty. We're going to put it down, but it's, you know, it's bad press, right? So they put soldiers there, again, professional soldiers, to guard this tomb, who would have been executed had they fallen asleep on the job. The very first people... Uh, the very first people to find the tomb was empty and the very first people to see Jesus risen were a group of women. I know in this day and age, this is really hard to fathom. But way back then, and you know, when they just didn't know any better, they thought women were crazy and unreliable. I'm so glad we've come so far. If they were going to make up a story and use credible witnesses to prove that it happened, they would not have picked a group of women to be the first people to go out and preach and tell everyone that Jesus had come back and they had seen him. If they were looking for credible witnesses to say, I saw Jesus with my own eyes, the tomb was empty, and he is coming, they would not have picked a group of women to do it. So why on earth did they? Because it's what happened. And they are reporting hey, this is crazy and this is what happened. When I talked earlier about when the New Testament was written, you've got written between... The earliest dates are, are debatable, right? We've, we've, there's a lot of wiggle room here going from... Some people will date things back as early uh, when you're looking at like Luke uh, or, or Mark will date things back as early as even like 30... 540 AD. Most people won't go back that far. Most people will say 50. Uh, but the furthest out you get any of them is about 90. Okay. And so my point with this is, is what Paul said when he wrote his down, he's like, look, then he appeared to 500 people, some of them Christians, you know, some of them believers, some of them non-believers. And I'm, I'm writing this right now. And it just happened a few years ago. And sure, a couple of people have died, but most of these people are still alive. Just go ask them. The books of the New Testament were written when the eyewitnesses, believers and non-believers alike, were still living. And so if, if, I wrote, if I wrote a book right now about how Mark Spann got up this morning and as he sang, he like levitated and flew around the auditorium, I'm not going to sell many books, right? Because you all are here and you watched it and you're going to see my book and be, what? People were still living at the time that this was written. I am poured out like the water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. Dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and pierced my feet. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Here's the thing. That was written a thousand years before Jesus was crucified. It was written 500 years before the first... There's one isolated account of what sounds like maybe possibly a crucifixion 500 years after this was written. 
Most people, you're, you're more like 700 years before the crucifixion was even invented, that this was written, and a thousand years before it happened. A thousand years before Jesus died, this was written. Just like the, the text that was in the, when we were singing earlier about him calming the waves on the boat with the disciples. A thousand years before it actually happened. Over and over and over. One of the things that I didn't even talk about at all today, which I find most fascinating and, and, and most convincing, is if you look at the fine-tuning of the universe uh, and, and while that it sounds just like what it is, that's also what it's called. You can look that up. The fine-tuning of the universe. This idea that, that the earth, where it sits, and the, the exact distance from the sun, and the exact rotation, and everything lined up perfectly, where if one single thing changes, everything falls apart, is like, you know, it's most often compared to you are walking down the street out here after, after services, you walk outside, and you find, you know, a $30,000 Rolex perfectly sitting on the sidewalk, and you pick it up and think, well, that's so crazy. I can't believe this thing just made itself. It, 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 the fine-tuning of everything is, it's, it leaves no room for anything else. But here's what really matters. Ravi Zacharias, he's one of the great apologists of our time, uh, who is still... If you can look him up. He does, he does speeches and debates at Yale and, and Princeton, and, and his, his speeches are great, but the question and answer with the students after it's over is by far the best stuff. But this is what he says. He says, if the truth is not undergirded by love, it makes the possessor of that truth obnoxious and the truth repulsive. Apologetics, this idea of defending the faith and having facts and reason, are great because you can show people, look, you don't have to just believe because I said so. It, it is not for religious terrorism to go and beat people over the head in arguments and feel like you just did something for the kingdom. Because even if you win, they didn't. It has to be undergirded by Love, And that's why Jesus stresses this over and over. In a, in a fantastic economy of words that Jesus had, this is why that concept of love is stressed over and over and over. That they will know you are mine, not by, because you got on TV and you won the great debate with the atheist, but by your love. How you love that person and how you handle love even when you are having a conversation or having a debate. If it's not done in love, then the truth is repulsive and we get nowhere. So, this morning, in such a 60,000-foot view of trying to just look at some of this, what I really want everyone to take away is that the evidence box isn't empty. The evidence box for this is, is full. And that's why when Paul said, you know, I went, I went every Sabbath, week after week after week, reasoning and persuading the Jewish scholars... It wasn't him going there week after week after week saying, believe better, pretend harder, have faith, but I'm not going to tell you what in, <laughs> right? Like, it's because the evidence box is full. I think we, we shifted the definition of faith because, you know, not long ago, I'm talking 50 to 70 years ago, you can read and see kind of that, that shifting of the definition of that word came when all of a sudden people got scared and started to think that science and God couldn't co cohabitate, that science was the enemy of God. Science is not the enemy of God. Science, science is a creation of God, and it displays his splendor. It's not the enemy. It's a beautiful thing. You just got to look for it. And so what I hope is I hope that this is, encourages you to go and, and look and read and study. I hope it gives confidence, you know, when you have kids who ask tough questions and hard questions that you can sit down and have conversations with them. Or you can say, I don't know, but we can look at, we can, we can look at it together. We can find it. You know, I'll study it with you. Um, I know, I'm, you can send me an email or come tap me on the shoulder if you're looking for resources, but it's there. It's not, it's not a unicorn, right? It's an atom. Faith is not faith in a unicorn. Faith in, in God is faith in an atom. The evidence box is full. 
So, this morning, I, I want to encourage you to, as we, as we finish as we finish our time of fellowship and, and we go and we get to hang out and have lunch and then best is we get to go and we go caroling. When you leave after that, I want you to go and, and be encouraged to look at some of this on your own because, like I said, we scratch the surface. It goes much deeper. I want to encourage you uh, here in just a minute that if there's anything we can pray with you about or we can pray for you, we, we would love to do that. We would love to do that because we want it to be not about anything other than we are called to love and we are called to be family. And so we want to be family to you. So here in a few minutes, Mark is going to stand and we're going to sing with him. And you can come down front. There will be a couple people standing down here. There will be some uh, men and women in the back standing on the back wall. You can go talk to one of them and let them pray with you or pray for you about anything that's going on. If you have questions about uh, what we talked about this morning... Or if you want to know, you want to know more about that God, the God who is true and is all powerful, but is also the God of love and who is the God who, as they talked about earlier, with grace and mercy and forgiveness, who wants a relationship. There's nothing we'd love better than to talk to you about that this morning as you stand and we sing. Thank you.